I'm Rachel Oliver and I'm one of the people who leads research projects within the Cambridge Gallium Nitride Centre. Now here at Cambridge we're keen to explain to the general public why we're so excited about this material, gallium nitride. We want to tell you about why this is an important material, what it's used for, but also some of the techniques that we use to understand it and to improve it. In this video, what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about one of the common applications of gallium nitride, which is in environmentally friendly, highly efficient light bulbs, and then to try to link that to how we investigate the properties of the gallium nitride and the sort of experiments we do, which involve some fairly high-tech equipment. So let's start by looking at some LED light bulbs. LED stands for light emitting diode and we'll talk about the actual light emitting diode devices inside these bulbs in a couple of moments. First though we can see that on the market there are lots of different LED light bulbs available and you can just fit them into a normal light fitting in your home. Here I'm showing two different bulbs. One of them is a warm white LED bulb and the other is a cold white. And all that means is that they have slightly different colours of light. The warm white is a bit more red and yellow and the cold white is a little bit more blue. And these are the sorts of choices you can make when you go and buy these bulbs from the shop. So let's think about what's actually inside that LED bulb. We've taken a bulb like this and broken it down so we can see what's inside. First, we've removed the glass cap, known as the diffuser, so that we can see what's underneath. And we can see what looks a bit like a yellow ping pong ball. That's actually a yellow phosphor, and if we lift that off, we can see the LEDs themselves underneath that phosphor cap. There are several LEDs here, and they're on a PCB, or printed circuit board. So why do we need that phosphor cap in addition to the LEDs? Well, what we want for a light to light up your house or my house is a nice white light. But inside, under the phosphor, the LEDs are actually giving out blue light. It's difficult to see that in this picture because the LEDs are such a bright blue light source that they're saturating the camera. So we've turned down the exposure in the image a little bit here and you can see each of those little bright blue glowing devices. That's what's under the cap are the blue light emitters but what we want is white light. When the blue light shines on the phosphor some of it is absorbed and the light that's given out from the phosphor is of different colours. All the different colours of light add up together to overall give a nice white light, which hopefully is a nice pleasant light for your home. So let's drill a little bit further down into this device. I said we had several LEDs on the printed circuit board. Let's look at one of them in a bit more detail. We're going to look here at a single LED chip, this one here. What we can see here is under a little polymer dome, the LED chip itself, and we've also got, shown here in gold, leads coming in and out which are going to carry electricity into the chip. We're now going to look under an optical microscope at that LED chip in a bit more detail. Now, this is starting to look a little bit complicated, and we've got two things labelled as the P electrode and the N electrode. Essentially, what an LED does is it converts electricity into light. And we need to be able to inject that electricity, and we do that through the electrodes. We need to have both positive and negative charge carriers going into the LED. And the positive charge carriers go through the P electrode, P for positive. The negative charge carriers go through the N electrode and the positive charge carriers and the negative charge carriers will be injected together into a light emitting region which I'll show you in a moment or two. Let's zoom in a bit further. So we were looking under an optical microscope but we can look at a small area of the LED under an electron microscope. 
This is an image from a scanning electron microscope looking at the top surface of the LED in plan view. But what we really are interested in is what's going in on under that surface. So using an ion beam, we can essentially dig a little hole in the surface of the LED and use that to peer in under the surface. And this is what we see. Here, we're looking at the cross section of the LED, so the side of that cut surface we made, that hole, to look at what is the stack of materials that make up the working device. Here, as well as the P and N electrode that we mentioned before, we can see the regions of the semiconductor material, which is what the LED itself is made up of, that we describe as the P-type and the N-type, the injectors of the positive and negative charge carriers. The SEM has allowed us to zoom in so that the whole thickness of the LED is seen, and that's about 5 microns thick, which is 5 one thousandths of a millimetre. But we haven't zoomed in enough here to see the light emitting region, the part of the LED that the actual light comes out of. To do that, we're going to have to zoom in even further. So here we are, zooming further in to the area I've just indicated with the little white box. And this is now the active part of the LED. We can see a region labelled PGAN. That PGAN is where the positive charge carriers come from. And the part right at the bottom of my picture will be the neg where the negative charge carriers come from. Right in the middle of the image, we can see what look like some stripes. They're labelled MQW, which stands for Multiple Quantum Well. That's really the heart of the LED. That's the active or light-emitting region. The charge carriers will come in from above and below, the positive and the negative charge carriers, and they'll become trapped in that region. Where they're trapped, they'll be forced to meet one another and combine, and where they combine is where the light's given out. Let's zoom in even further on this active light-emitting region. So here we go, just zooming in on the quantum wells themselves. OK, so now we're looking at those quantum wells in some detail, and what we start to see is that they really are very, very tiny. So I said that the LED chip itself was maybe five one-thousandths of a millimetre thick. The layers we're seeing here are a thousand times smaller than that again. We measure those sorts of thicknesses in nanometers, um, one-thousandth of a millionth of a metre. So these very, very tiny layers are what confine the negative and positive charge carriers in a very small region, forcing them to combine with one another. And that's the reason why we have to use some rather sophisticated techniques to examine these materials. Here we're using a transmission electron microscope, which is a microscope which allows us to image things at the nanometer scale, or even down to the atomic scale. And understanding the structure of the layers I'm showing you here right down at the atomic scale is actually key to optimising the performance of these sorts of devices. So that's a little tiny bit about how we examine these devices, but how do we make them in the first place? Well, the technique we use is called Metal Organic Vapour Phase Epitaxy, or MOVPE. In MOVPE, we have sources of the different ingredients we need to make the LED. So the LED is basically made from gallium and nitri nitrogen, so we need a source of gallium, which is trimethyl gallium, and we need a source of nitrogen, which in our case is ammonia. And those two react together to build the gallium nitride crystal, and methane is formed as a byproduct. And we form the gallium nitride crystal by laying down, atom by atom, layers and layers of gallium, gallium and nitrogen atoms through this reaction. So one of the key pieces of equipment within our laboratory are the big crystal growth systems, which we call reactors, within which these reactions take place and we grow the crystal layers which enable us to form devices. In our lab, we are lucky enough to have a variety of these MOVPE reactors. 
This is our oldest system. It's been in the group for more than 15 years now. It allows us to grow six wafers of gallium nitride simultaneously, each of those wafers being two inches across. We also have a more modern, more production style um, system in which we can similarly grow both six two inch wafers or one larger wafer six inches across. And finally, we are having installed a much larger system which will allow us to grow on 8-inch wafers and that's going to allow us to scale up our research to a much more industrial level. So the growth reactors are very much at the heart of our laboratory, but we also use a lot of different characterization techniques. I've already talked about some of them. One that I haven't mentioned would be atomic force microscopy which shows us the surfaces of our crystals and given that the growth of the crystal essentially happens by atoms joining onto the surfaces, the surface characteristics are really important. We also use X-ray diffraction. That allows us, amongst other things, to measure the very, very thin layers in terms of how thick they are and how, um, what ingredients they have inside them, what composition they have, and we can do that in a non-destructive fashion using X-rays. We also use a scanning electron microscope. I've shown quite a lot of scanning electron microscopy images already. And our scanning electron microscope also allows us to look at the light emitted from these materials. That's called cathodoluminescence, or CL. And it allows us to look at a very small scale at what factors are affecting the light emission performance. We have a focused iron beam microscope, which is where what we use to dig little holes in the sample and look at them from different angles and take different sections and then we can do really detailed up to atomic resolution microscopy using a transmission electron microscope. We use all these techniques to characterize both materials and full devices but if we want to check the performance of the devices we actually have what we call a probe station which allows us to measure in some detail how much light a device gives out and what its electrical properties are, and generally to test its performance and the way in which it fails. So we can work across the board, characterising both the materials and the devices, and hopefully optimising those devices so that they're more efficient and more effective for use in applications like the light bulbs we started with. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little bit about our research and about the techniques we use. We're planning to upload some more videos explaining those techniques in more detail, both about how they work and what they're useful for. So do stay tuned.